Improvisation became extremely fashionable in theatrical practice. In most cases, it is seen as something absolutely free, doing what you want. This should bring actors to revealing their utmost potential. But looks can be deceiving, and what is understood as the freest form of acting is subdued to unfreedom. And the chaotic flow of such improvisation is a sign of this unfreedom. People's mind and psychics, and actors' mind and psychics either, function in such a way that new things and improvisation among them can't be performed without certain restrictions and patterns to be based upon, due to the rule of no new episode 18. If actors are asked to perform improvisation without any limitation previously set, it leads to chaos, uncertainty, helplessness. Our mind defends itself because it doesn't have anything to rest upon, nothing to use. It feels helpless and lonely. That is why the mind is so willing to base improvisation on the most known things, cliches in various forms. Quite often, for example, it is mentioned of spontaneity and improvisation. But if someone imagines they are spontaneous, are they really spontaneous indeed? The first thing they will do in such a situation is to multiply stereotypes. Mixing things that are easy and cheap with what spontaneous is, is one of the simplest and easiest ways to behave on the stage. And the easiest thing is to do what we are used to. This means they, the ones who consider themselves spontaneous, will start with stereotypes or, on the contrary, will try to be wild. We are all strikingly Eurocentric, so a completely erroneous image of what is considered to be primitive and wild lives in us. So this spontaneous one will spontaneously roll on the ground, push and stick to others, utter wild screams, sob hysterically, and all that in order to eventually move to a certain opposite, to the embodiment of some kind of Arcadia, that is, sensitively taking everyone by the hand, hugging and such like. All these are solid stereotypes. Can one start without stereotypes? That is the question. Until now I have not achieved anything like this in my life. You always fall into this or other stereotype. But when you are already on the trajectory, then the inevitable thing is the cleaning of stereotypes. And fast, hurry, before they get automated, because otherwise everything will have to be redone during a long time. People will multiply stereotypes over and over, assuring everything is spontaneous and improvisational about them, and then nothing could be done. It is necessary to suppress and cut off such type of a lie as quickly as possible, because otherwise each subsequent one will already manifest itself at a higher level, a higher stair step. Let's talk about a group improvisation. First of all, you need to be able to see trivialities, recognize the emerging cliches. Trivialities might arise in the work on improvisation. They might also appear in the work on forms and structures. Here are some examples of group improvisation cliches. Portraying wildness, imitate a trance, working exaggeratedly with hands, 
acting out a procession, carrying someone above it, also portraying a scapegoat and his persecutors, comfort the victim, portraying innocence, however mixed with irresponsibility, and finally offering the audiences their own cliches of everyday social behavior as a natural behavior the so-called everyday manner of behaving in a bistro, let's say. So, to achieve anything worthy in improvisation, you need to start by eliminating these and many other trivialities. I would also advise to avoid convulsions. You do not have to thrash your feet against the floor. Fall on the ground and a crawl there without no need for it, you do not have to portray monsters. I would not advise practicing that. Then, perhaps some worthwhile things will come to light. It will be found, for example, that the contact is impossible if we are not able to refuse contact. This is the problem of recognition connection and non-connection. But typically people who practice what they call improvisation themselves plunge into amateurism and irresponsibility. To work in improvisation you need a kind of holy awareness, you need sacred action. Here in this work only good will cannot save anyone but only self-control in the craft can. Of course, when self-control is present, then the question of the heart can also be raised. Talking about the heart when you have not achieved the self-control in the craft is a deception. When self-control is achieved, then we can meet face to face with both heart and soul. Then we can accept this challenge. It's curious how Knebel wrote about the same things. It is interesting that there is a splash of standards in the first studies. For example, the obligatory expulsion of a medicine man or Spain singing and playing the guitars. Those who work in improvisation have the chance to see with frightening clarity how rapidly the boundaries of so-called freedom are reached. Our exercises in public with the theater of cruelty quickly led the actors to the point where they were nightly ringing variations on their own cliches. Like Marcel Marceau's character who breaks out of one prison to find himself within another. We experimented, for instance, with an actor opening a door and finding something unexpected. He had to react to the unexpected sometimes in gesture, sometimes in sound, sometimes with paint. He was encouraged to express the first gesture, cry or splash that came to him. At first, all this showed was the actor's stock of similes. The open mouth of surprise, the step back in horror. Where did these so-called spontaneities come from? Clearly the true and instantaneous inner reaction was checked, and like lightning, the memory substituted some imitation of a form once seen. Debbing the paint was even more revealing, the hair's breadth of terror before the blankness, and then the reassuring ready-made idea coming to the rescue. This deadly theater lurks inside us all. The aim of improvisation in training actors in rehearsal and the aim of exercises is always the same. It is to get away from deadly theater. It is not just a matter of splashing about in self-indulgent euphoria, as outsiders often suspect. For it aims 
at bringing the actor again and again to his own barriers, to the points where, in place of newfound truth, he normally substitutes a lie. However, there are some specific acting exercises, beside performances and rehearsals, that practice wild, pure improvisation, aiming to free actors from psychological tension and blocks, to teach actors how to follow their creative impulses. Of course, such exercises must not use clichés as they didn't free of anything. The whole process needs to be supervised ultra-carefully. Improvisation, as we know it, comes from Commedia dell'arte, yet there it was mainly limited by a character mask, or a so-called kernel. A character, let's say Pantalone, had to react to different situations and spontaneous progress of a show, not losing Pantalone's essence in any circumstances. Draw in on the principles of Commedia dell'arte, it is improvisation based on a plot scheme. It should be built according to the principles of the comedy of masks, an approximate scenario and a free game improvisation. Actors must be able to play the artistic image in all positions, not only in that passage from the character's life which is given in the play. This passage is only a particular thing, and you don't need to play it, you need to play a general one. Actors should not know what will happen to them when they enter the stage. They must go on the stage as we go to some kind of conversation, to a meeting in our lives. And when you study on your own, you should not edit a play given. You generally need to learn how to evaluate facts. Actors should be trained in such a way that, before the entrance, they could have been told things they should play, their past, relationship to others around, an objective, and they could be already playing. Feelings, words, etc. flow. That would be a real Commedia dell'arte. This is the ideal. However, Commedia dell'arte has always been conditional. Until now, not a single actor has dared to perform without an author, without words being memorized not in a conditional role, to play a characteristic role as improvisation. Understand that preparing a role does not mean rehearsing the piece. Preparing a role means looking for the relationship that is necessary for it within yourself. Not all actors have the same attitude to different kinds of constraints, but they all need constraints, even the actors of Italian Commedia dell'arte, even if they were free improvisers, saying what they wanted, entering the stage not knowing in advance what they would do there and how the action would develop. Today it could end in a wedding and tomorrow in murder. Complete freedom, as it may seem, the same as in life is, without any prior schedule, yet they needed one constraint, a mask, Harlequin, Punchinello, Columbine, etc. Their theater was even called the comedy of masks. As you can see, it is impossible without constraints in art. And it turns out that the freedom of these improvisers was relative as well. So many great directors and artists claim one thing. Improvisation to be real and true should be limited in some way. As Mayer Holt said, the improvisational state 
in the iron riverbed of action. This iron riverbed denotes aspects of all kinds. I mean, improvisation might be limited by different things, by a certain idea, a theme, a character, fixed text, action, mise-en-scene, given circumstances, etc. Basically, we need two ingredients. The improvisational self-feeling or sense of self, meaning an actor's self that is eager to improvise and live, and a restriction of some kind. As an example, one may encounter the difference between improvisation, which is manifested randomly, and improvisation, which acts as a repeating adjustment, re-adaptation, to a particular structure, that is, harmonious improvisation. An amateur can do a pretty thing more or less superficially with the help of this kind of nerve excitation at the level of the first improvisation, but they will sculpt in a haze, and like a haze, everything will wisp. A dabbler searches at the sides. In our art, much is done by the way of improvisation on the same theme, firmly fixed. Such creativity imparts freshness and spontaneity to a performance. Our exercise does not pursue the goal to deviate from the final version of Gribuyedo's text at all costs, to make an admiral out of a general. This is a draft too primitive for Griboyedov. I am counting on more. In your improvisations you ought to reach the root, the main idea of Griboyedov, the thought that made him write this piece of text. All these Vachtangov's requirements made actors immensely responsible for their slightest performing manifestation on the stage. It was no longer possible to reveal the content of inner life as it was revealing itself. Everything was now fixed and cast into a precise embossed shape. Only later, when everything was done, the actor was again given the right to improvise movements, gestures, intonations, in accordance with the requirements to which the form or the performance is subordinated. Thus, the actors got the right to improvise adjustments only when there was a guarantee that they had so firmly mastered the principles of playing in a given performance that their improvisation would not go beyond the boundaries of these principles. Vachtangov called this ability to improvise one's adjustments with a sense of their responsibility for them, that is, subordinating them to the requirements of form and skill, a stageism. The attitude was set. The actors freely improvised. It gave them the joy of comprehending new characters, relationships. Humor resumed. We have once again made sure that an improvisational basis is necessary in the correct search for the nature of feelings. And this improvisational basis is different every time, completely dependent on the given place world. Actors' improvisation cannot and should not be purposeless. Only a clearly intended improvisational nature assigns the desired result. No matter how far an actor has moved away from the play's text improvising, the director and the actor build it on the basis of given circumstances selection, extracted from the material of the play and the author's conception. The whole difficulty of searching for the nature of feelings lies in the need to 
simultaneously think about all the elements that make up the search throughout the rehearsal process. Among them are the selection of given circumstances, and the improvisation born on its basis, and the method of contact with the audience in the future performance. Otherwise, twin performances and monotonous acting works appear that have nothing to do with the problem of transfiguration in the sense Stanislavski understood it. However, this improvisational principle, which helped us so much during the rehearsal, did not exclude at all a very clear and thoughtful performance's organization to the smallest detail in all other directions. Improvisational actors' self-feeling within the framework of an exact director score of the play. Freedom of the actor as a conscious necessity under the conditions of the text offered by an author. Director's mise-en-scenes and the general concept of their performance. The improvisational principle of acting is closely connected with the emotional nature of our art. After all, it is possible to improvise under the conditions of the performance's accurate form. Over in, many actors understand improvisation as anarchy and fixation of the purely external pattern of the role is made almost to the point of actor's main virtue and ranked as a part of the skilled acting notion. This means that in any rehearsal, at the moment of the first reading at the table and its subsequent moments, in the initial, even improvised movement of an actor, this feeling is living all the time. The feeling of the performance's rhythmic wholeness. The cultivation of this precious acting quality in oneself, to act, to react to the whole stage impression, is achieved by two factors of the creative process. First, an active and creative state before starting the work at rehearsals and performances, readiness for action. Second, improvisational self-feeling. On this basis, actors acquire the ability to interact on the stage, to communicate with a partner, that is, the ability to influence a partner and determine their behavior from a partner. The second factor determining the actor's ability to act on the stage as if for the first time is their improvisational self-feeling under conditions that conduce little to improvisation, in the conditions of a performance. Despite the fact that all the moments of the performance are rehearsed, checked and fixed in advance, the actor must carry this a state of constant readiness for improvisation in the performance and fulfill it where possible. The actors, as it were, hunt out for all sorts of creative surprises around them, keep track of what shades of thought come to life in a partner. Mastering the state of readiness for improvisation, we somewhat half forget about everything that we know very well, and begin to react to everything as if for the first time. The fixed form of the performance does not in any way contradict our position on the improvisational self-feeling of an actor in the process of the performance, since within the established role pattern there can be and should always be a certain degree of improvisation. Any incident on the stage can serve as a check of actor's readiness for improvisation. A hat falling on the ground, a partner's a slip of the tongue, etc. Actors who are always ready for improvisation 
cannot be distracted or become upset by such incidents. On the contrary, these incidents excite them in a creative manner. When actors are late with their reaction to an incident, that is, when this reaction is not born to them involuntarily, it indicates a lack of the necessary creative faith and readiness. It often happens that an experienced actor faced with such incident with a stage weight calmly corrects the slip. In such cases, the spectator notes didn't get lost. Indeed, this actor was not taken aback, but he was not found either, because to be found on the stage means to involuntarily react to the unexpected. In each specific case, the actor's creative imagination tells them one or another character of their reaction. This process is well understood in sport, where no one would mistake training before a race with planning the course of the race. And to my mind, sport gives the most precise images and best metaphors for a theatrical performance. On the one hand, in a race or in a football match, there is no freedom at all. There are rules, the game is calculated on the most rigorous lines, just as in theatre, where each performer learns his role and respects it down to the last word. But this all-guiding scenario does not prevent him from improvising when the event occurs. When the race starts, the runner calls up all the means at his disposal. As soon as a performance begins, the actor steps into the structure of the mise-en-scene. He too becomes completely involved. He improvises within the established guidelines and, like the runner, he enters the unpredictable. In this way, everything stays open, and for the audience the event occurs at this precise moment, neither before nor after. Seen from heaven, every football match looks the same, but no match could even be repeated, detail by detail. So the strict preparation does not rule out the unexpected unfolding of the living texture, which is the match itself. Without the preparation, the event would be weak, messy, meaningless. However, the preparation is not to establish form. We have discovered through our experience in Africa, in America and France, playing in isolated villages and tough urban areas for racial minorities, old people, children, delinquents, the mentally handicapped, the deaf, the blind, that no two performances can ever be identical. We have learned that improvisation is an exceptionally difficult and precise technique and very different from the generalized idea of a spontaneous happening. Improvisation requires a great skill on the part of the actors in all aspects of theater. It requires specific training and also great generosity and a capacity for humor. Genuine improvisation leading up to a real encounter with the audience only occurs when the spectators feel that they are loved and respected by the actors. We encourage the actors to see themselves not only as improvisers, lending themselves blindly to their inner impulses, but as artists responsible for searching and selecting a monk's form, so that a gesture or a cry becomes like an object that he discovers and even remotes. And for Othello, in order not to forgive Desdemona in the end, it is necessary alone that he improvises in the exact 
circumstances and does not improvise the circumstances themselves. You should not prohibit, you have to throw in the circumstances. Not you mustn't pick your nose, but it should be you are a prince after all. And he would not want to do that. When it comes to acting in a particular role, the conversation about freedom, improvisation and life is relatable. Is it possible to talk about all of this regarding vocal and instrumental performance? After all, everything is regulated there. Not only words but also music and shades of melodic lines and the rhythm of these words. Everything is precisely indicated and entered in notes. Is it really everything? And why does one pianist play like a machine, like a pianola, and we want him to finish as soon as possible, while another excites, thrills, carries our imagination away. Both play correctly. Neither one nor the other shifts away from the notes, but the first one only performs what was accurately written, knocks out some sounds, and the second one took the composer's musical thought, was imbued with it as his own, and through it now expresses his feelings, thoughts, will. Once I happened to hear a singer who was merging so much with every piece he performed that he got the full impression of improvisation. He was so imbued with the composer's thought, mastered it so that it seemed the piece was just being born, that he was creating it at the moment of performance. Most important things, everything roughly fixed, everything written in notes, was in position without a hitch. You would not pick at anything. But such a mass of elusive, unique shades always varied that the work itself seems unrecognizable, different every time. Even the well-known melody seemed to be both exactly the one and no longer the same. It has become enriched, expanded. It speaks about something new, deep, excites our hearts with something else. Experienced musicians try to record these subtle aspects, but it turned out to be completely impossible. Further on, I would like to advise you never to look for spontaneity in a performance without active score. It would only be an imitation, as chaos would destroy all your spontaneity. In an exercise, the active score is made up of details fixed, and I would advise you to improvise with the exception of special improvisations suggested by the teacher or director, only within these details. In short, you need to know the details of the exercises. Today I need this and that. I will come up with them and you may try to find their variations. This will lead you to genuine improvisation. And so, from our perspective, spontaneity not only does not exclude a detailed composition of a role, but on the contrary, genuine and not fake spontaneity can be achieved only on the basis of an accurate actor's active score. Otherwise, there is no authenticity. Undisciplined spontaneity, in fact, gives rise to a kind of biological chaos effect, leads to amorphous and accidental reactions. Screams, rushing around, spasmodic movements that look like convulsions, all of this is not a spontaneous reaction at all, but rather have buffoonery, have an attempt to forcefully pump spontaneity. And all of this is hard, 
strained. True spontaneity is easy and free. This is the problem of a special bringing out. Through a multitude of details, a stream of human impulses and reactions purified from any chance event as if to the very core. As a result, a stream of signs drawn by the whole organism emerges. For actors, this stream becomes a kind of an active score, a launching pad or a springboard, starting from which they can mobilize and put into action their deeply personal, intimate impressions, a whole range of their life experiences and Playing this way, create every day the same score with themselves, with all their being, with the integrity of their spiritual and physical capabilities. And this means improvising not externally, but internally, around prepared motives, personal themes. This is exactly what I mean when I speak about spontaneity born out of the spirit of order, out of regulation, improvisation, impulses, vigilant consciousness, improvisation within a framework. One of the most interesting peculiarities of Chekhov's improvisations was that the actor never changed either the text or the established mise-en-scenes. He could not sit on a chair not intended for him, and if he did, he knew how to free it in time. Sometimes he really knocked the partners out of the strict track of the performance, but only with the unexpectedness and brightness of the adjustments. His improvisations did not create chaos, they only called upon others to create just as freely as he did. Proceed to short improvisations, trying to maintain the sense of form as you play. There can be many beginnings and ends in improvisation. Try to fleetingly mark them in your mind. Avoid harshness that can creep into your exercises. This might happen, however, only if your idea of form becomes too external. The living form does not originate outside, but inside, in the soul. Now, imagine that between the initial and closing moments, you have set another transitional moment in the middle. In the process of improvisation, nothing would change for you of it. You would freely pass through the medium moment and head to the closing one. Imagine now you have set a lot of such moments and that you move from one to the next. What would this exercise remind you of? Is not that what you do while rehearsing or playing a piece written by an author? The only difference is that starting to work on a finished play by usual means, you forget yourself as an improviser and unconsciously assume that the author had already done all the creative work for you and you just have to follow instructions to the letter. You diminish the importance of your creative process, reducing it to a secondary level. But if you eliminate this purely psychological error and develop your ability to improvise through exercises, you will soon come to the conviction that theatrical art is unceasing improvisation, that there is no moment on the stage when you, as an actor, are deprived of the opportunity to improvise. It hardly needs to be mentioned that Improvisation should not be transformed into arbitrariness of the actor on the stage. Actors must not distort either the author's text or the director's mise-en-scenes. Without them, their improvisation would have no foundation. 
The freedom of the improvising actors is expressed in how they pronounce the author's words, follow the director's mise en scenes, how they shade the role's interpretation found during the rehearsals. Experience shows the more preserving actors treat the overall performance's composition, the freer they feel themselves as improvisers. And here is some evidence to explain demonstrably what is meant when talking about improvisation within a fixed structure. Actors who properly and to the end devote themselves to the process will certainly reveal a sufficiently expressive form. Here are two pieces of evidence of Machalov's performance of the same scene in the play Ugolino, Machalov played the role of Nino. When, as it happened, they kill Veronica behind the scenes and Nino goes down the hill singing and almost jumping up, calls his wife, looks for her, saying, I know she has hidden, probably, such minx she is and entering the house sees her stabbed. Oh, then, you would not be able to express what was happening to him. Sometimes he would run merrily into the house, scream there terribly, and, exiting, would fix his eyes on the open door and, quietly, quietly, retreating, whisper in his melodic voice, She is dead, dead and repeats this word, crossing the whole stage, as if wishing to convince himself. Finally, he would stop with the word stabbed, bursting into real tears. Then there is a long silence, because the audience is crying with him, and no one is applauding. And sometimes he would swiftly run across the whole stage, stopping front of the audience, look with dull eyes and ask, dead, 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 and as if answering himself, he says, stabbed, and falls into rage and despair. Entering the house and seeing his family killed, Nino returns to the stage delusioned, Machalov did this once. He ran out of the house with a mad smile, crashed to the ground and ran on all fours across the stage, and the audience turned to stone with horror. It seems that improvisation can be of two levels. The lower level is a fixed improvisation found during rehearsals in an iron riverbed of a particular structure, and the higher level of improvisation, a new one every time, following the ultimate improvisational principles here, today, now, please check episode 6, and performing as if for the first time. Stanislavski assigns to consciousness an organizing and guiding part in creativity, stressing that not everything in the constructive creative process is amenable to the control of consciousness. Stanislavski clearly identifies the scope of its activity. In his opinion, the creative goal, objectives, given circumstances, the active score of the actions performed should be conscious. That is everything that an actor does on the stage. But the moment of performing these actions, which occurs every time under the unique conditions of the today's life flow, with a complex interweaving of various actors' self-feelings and unpredictable accidents, that affect these self-feelings cannot be fixed once and for all. This moment, according to Stanislavski, should be to some extent improvisational, in order to preserve the ingenuousness 
freshness and uniqueness of the creative process. This is where Stanislavski's formula arises. What is conscious? How is unconscious? Moreover, unconsciousness of how not only does not mean from Stanislavski's point of view chaos and arbitrariness in creating the stage form, but, on the contrary, is the result of the artist's great conscious work on it. The artist consciously creates conditions under which feelings arise in them subconsciously and involuntarily, similar to the character's experiences. The most important elements of the stage form, how, are organically connected with the content, motives and objectives of actions, what. Hence, they are a consequence of the artist's conscious mastery of the character's logic of behavior in the place given circumstances. Finally, unconsciousness of how does not exclude a certain amount of consciousness that controls the actor's play both in the process of preparing the role and at the moment of public creativity. Improvisation is not only the artist's existence in the style of the theatre dell'arte. This is one of the improvisation types, and the simplest it is. And what does Stanislavski's demand today, here, now mean? A role is built, but if suddenly actors play outside the free improvisational existence, it means they have lost life. The birth of the here, today, now process, isn't it about improvisation in the highest sense of the word? There is no stage action outside of improvisation. The organized improvisation should become the final outcome, I would say. Director Serge steers an organized improvisation to organized one. Essentially, this is the process of building a role. Remember Mayhall's formula maintaining an improvisational state in the iron riverbed of action. Constructed yet live process is the highest class of improvisation. And if you have killed an artist's improvisation, therefore you have killed his soul, leaving only a cold background. I paid special attention to the creative connection between actors and their audience. The actors who create today, here, now. Our task is to involve spectators into creative process, but without an actor's improvisational self-feeling, it is impossible to achieve such connection with the audience. The culture of the actor's improvisational self-feeling should be one of the main tasks of modern theatre. Any most Directorial performance admits an actor's improvisation. This is specifically the strength of the theatre. But we have already found out that for an actor to embody ultimately means to represent, and to transfigurate is to experience the role every day at each performance, sensing spectators of today evaluating the place given circumstances from the standpoint of the present day having been lived through. That is, to creatively improvise in the most accurate and strictly established performance's active score. It is no coincidence that Stanislavski says that if actors sweat, they are not artists then. And here, of course, the question is not only in physical sweat, but in the ability to achieve one's intention with the utmost ease and simplicity. Still, this ease is the result of hard work. To reproduce everything that has been found, everything predetermined in advance, with such an effortless ease and improvisational freshness, as if all of this arose just now, this very minute, 
in front of the spectator's eyes, this is the fundamental and most difficult skill in our acting mastery. The creative ability, as it were, to move back from everything that is perfectly known and to feel everything, to perceive it as if a new, supposedly for the first time, is the most precious quality of an actor. The more in detail, the more actively the play's active score is developed, the more active and richer the improvisational principle of acting should be. Improvising in the conditions of the things required is the way of true art. No matter how elaborated the play's active score is, still an actor has numerous opportunities for improvisation, and they remain so. But if this is not the case, a boring reproduction of what was planned, what was agreed upon, begins. The work of a great skillful artist on the stage always gives the impression of spontaneity, freshness, as if all the actor's actions have happened by accident just now. Such spontaneity is the outcome of great efforts. To hide the traces of such work, to remove a sweat from art, is the master's task. The ability to improvise, to forget everything that is known, the skill to forget everything that the partners have agreed upon, upon which they have agreed with the director, etc., and a kind of, as if for the first time, recreate everything in you, exactly this ability makes a great master out of an actor, a great artist on the stage. Outside of the skill, we see either a dabbler who is not capable of anything at all, or pseudo-masters who point with their fingers at everything they do that very moment. And pay attention to how I did it. Did you all see? Did everyone get it? Otherwise, I can show it again. This is, at the best, childhood disease of mastery. Improvisation is not only the way of self-feeling of a trained actor's stage existence, but also the heart of two acting methods. The method of studies, episode 15, and the method of active analysis, which is both directorial and acting investigation or analysis by the means of action, dealing with facts and events, characteristics, super objectives, and up to most subtle aspects of their relationships, thoughts, in the world. The Stanislavski's method is aimed at waking up the artist's lively nature through action and activating the work of the subconscious. It creates the artist's improvisational self-feeling, tells them true and truthful deeds, and makes their stage behavior alive. The method of the Stanislavski school is fundamentally different from all other schools and movements in the matter of what should be fixed in the rehearsal process. According to the Stanislavski school, the motivating causes for action and behavior are fixed. The very action, adjustments, evaluations, in a word, the whole process is created anew every time, as primary and instantaneous one. That is, an improvisational self-feeling is at the heart of everything. And, consequently, improvisation is either. Today's theater swears by Stanislavski much more than it follows him. One of the most important dissimilarities between these methodologies is that for the school of representation, Improvisation and stage suddenness are destructive. For the school of emotional experience, they are a desirable standard. A study 
attitude as a form of conducting a rehearsal is something else. Here are completely different goals, objectives, criteria. It means that an already relatively experienced performer who is able to act improvisationally in given circumstances, who mastered the organic nature of the stage process, having analyzed the situation created by the playwright together with the director, will try to live this situation through by passing the author's text and using all the skills and experience gained in the educational study. Thus, the subject of an artist's creative interest at the time of rehearsal becomes action, deed, conflict, circumstances, and not words behind which it is so easy to hide, which one just wants to play out in different ways. In this situation, the main criterion for evaluating the study becomes, first of all, the compliance of the improvisation logic with the author's logic. The reasons for deviation from this logic are being looked for. Repetitions of the study are necessary. They bring the performers closer and closer to effective structure, to motives of the character's behavior given by a playwright. The author's text begins to be memorized by itself. Separate exact expressions, whole phrases pop up in the artist's memory now and then. With each repetition, improvisation is getting closer and closer to that written by the playwright. I ask you to find this attitude through a study, an improvisation, and act as your artistic instinct tells you. Konstantin Sergeyevich did not demand an abundance of words and thoughts from us in these studies improvisations, but he watched very strictly the correct estimation of the environment around us, the correct attitudes to each other. The actors brilliantly improvised the action, knowing the text, their attitude towards each other and events. When working upon a study as a literary adaptation, the situation proposed by an author is put at the forefront and only the most important given circumstances that determine it are taken. Our task is to independently and effectively study this situation, the logic of action, the behavior of people who act in it, to create a range of given circumstances that cause this behavior. In other words, the basis of this work becomes the independent creation of life in a given situation. To a large extent, freeing ourselves from the author's clues, here we generally do not raise the question of characterness, character, and conduct research under the principle of I am in the given circumstances. Improvisation becomes the basis, and not only of the text, but of the whole process. The basis happens to be the training of improvisational self-feeling in oneself. It implies immediacy, primariness, and spur of the moment of the creative process. What is required of an actor to master the method? In a creative artistic quest, actors must be able to preserve the improvisation in their existence. Only under this condition can the method of active analysis be fulfilled. A director working within the method must keep the performance in a state of creative improvisation. If an artist is compliant, conscientious, diligent, but is not in a state of improvisation, nothing will come out of it. That is why the method of active analysis most often meets resistance from experienced and skillful artists, for all their habits and reflexes developed, internally 
protest against the method, regardless of their will. Such artists may theoretically recognize it, but in essence the active analysis is incompatible to them. And what is most important for actors with this method of work? Ability to think in an actionable manner, which gives them the freedom to improvise. The logic of the truth of life, combined with improvisational freedom, this connection seems to me the most significant for an actor. The method provides us with such a creative process in which the conscious, so to speak, pushes the subconscious out of us. This is the meaning of the method. We must come to it. Ultimately, improvisation is a vital and inescapable principle of creativity and art itself. A study improvisation is the top form of the creative process for both the actors and directors. To acquire the psychology of an improvising actor means to find yourself as an artist. There are all the conditions for the stage acting creativity of the emotional experience here, including improvisation, this distinctive feature of performing artistic creative process. The nature of an artist which must be awakened, cannot be revealed outside the atmosphere of an improvisational search. Rehearsal is a constant improvisation, searching all the time, not shouting, do it this way. Actors must come into the given circumstances with all their organicity. Everything that takes on a frozen, motionless form in the actors' play draws them away from the very essence of their profession – improvisation. The improvising actors use the theme, the text, the character's personality given to them by the author as a pretext for the free manifestation of their creative individuality. Their psychology significantly differs from the psychology of actors who are incapable of improvisation on the stage, while the latter cling pedantically to successful playing techniques they have once found. To the author's remarks, strive for exact repetition of the mise-en-scenes appointed to them, and consider their main task to pronounce the text given to them by the author, the improvising actors feel themselves much more independent. No matter how many times they perform the same role, they always find new nuances for their play at every moment of their stage presence. And in the drama, in directing and in the work of actors, improvisation is the key of the creative process. And the decisive factor here is the unity of the collective common searches of all the performances creators. When I read Fellini's notes, I found some positive confirmation of this idea. It is even more difficult in the movies, though. A strong stereotype of what the director should do has developed there building an iron-clad director's script, where everything should be foreseen in advance, where every turn of the artist's head, close-ups, medium and wide shots are determined. The entire film is practically recorded in this scenario. Directors must foresee everything long before filming begins. Only then can they make a good picture. Routinely, it looked like this. But then Fellini appeared and changed everything. Each of his films is born straightforwardly on the set. This is how Chaplin worked. Surprisingly interesting are those shots of a television film about him, 
when he does not know what to do next, and catching on one detail comes up with a whole plot. All these examples grew me to believe the idea that improvisation is the key of the creative process in all its aspects and spheres. I used it only when working with artists usually. But now I see that the education of young directors should be premised on improvisation. If the whole work is not imbued with an improvisational spirit, the director will not be born. This is the basis of the living theatre. It is here that the watershed between the living and the dead theatre lies. Through all my life I have been making one discovery. The most important thing is to cultivate an improvisational way of rehearsals. And the more I live, the more I understand this. Directing talent is the ability to create an improvisational atmosphere around oneself. I have been looking for this improvisational nature in myself all my life. Improvisation is one of the most effective means that is able to save the modern stage from stiffness. Improvisation is designed to protect a viable creative organism from the destructive bacteria of lifeless theater. I am convinced that improvisation should become the leading principle of theatrical creativity today.